Hi everyone, this is Mrs. Clemens, and we today are going to be talking about the Cold War at home. We're going to talk about McCarthyism, and we're going to talk about a lot of the fear that Americans had surrounding the Cold War. Um, I just want to start because you guys know at this point I love propaganda, and one of the really interesting things that came out of the Cold War was um, propaganda in different kind of formats than had really happened before. One of the big ones was comic books. Um, so <laughs> these are actual things from during the Cold War. So Hal Stalin hopes he will destroy America. <laughs> and I, I like his little hammer and sickle, sickle thing on the globe. Uh, the Red Iceberg. And you have Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, China, North Korea, and East Germany. And this definitely goes along with, is, uh, particularly North Korea and East Germany, with our last episode where we were talking about um, containment. Uh, is this tomorrow America under communism and everything's on fire? And then, yeah, definitely, guys, those of you that are fans of Marvel Comics, you should definitely check out. Um, there's a lot of comic books. Um, from the 50s and 60s that have, um, you know, the heroes basically fighting against communism. So uh, the Crimson Dynamo, obviously, red represents communism. Um, so I just think that's really, really neat. All right, so we're on the lookout. We're on the lookout for communists everywhere. Uh, so they have all kinds of different things that they do to look out for them. Uh, one of the first ones is this thing called HUAC, or the House Un-American Activities Committee. Um, they were trying to find uh, root out um, activities, um, people, uh, all kinds of things that were seen as being communist. They called in a ton of different people to testify. Um, if you end up, um, and this goes on with all these things like McCarthyism, obviously, um, if in English you read the crucible, uh, you know, this idea of a witch hunt, um, definitely comes from this. Uh, you have the loyalty review board where they're calling in major, major people. So one of the people that they called in, uh, was this man named Robert Oppenheimer, and he was the director of the Manhattan Project. You guys might remember the Manhattan Project is, um, the, the major undertaking to produce the atomic bombs that we ended up using on Japan. And so, uh, because he ended up criticizing that, um, you know, because the damage and loss of life, uh, later on, he became known as a communist sympathizer. Um, so there were definitely a lot of like looking for communists. Um, not everyone was actually found to be communists, um, but we do have uh, one really famous one, uh, this man named Alger Hiss. He was convicted of being a spy. And one of the people that led the charge here, um, I don't know if you guys recognize him. Uh, this is a young Richard Nixon. This is him prior to becoming vice president. Um, he ends up becoming Eisenhower's running mate in part because he was um, known as being so hard on communists. And then obviously you guys know, eventually he ends up becoming president. So he gets his start um, searching for communists. Uh, then in the Senate, we have Joseph McCarthy. And so you get a ton of different things happening where people are blacklisted out of their jobs um, that, uh, you know, they can't get jobs anywhere because they're um, seen as being communists. People are being expected to um, turn, turn in other suspected communists to get themselves um, out of trouble. And one of the big areas that was impacted was Hollywood. Um, many screenwriters and actors were accused um, in our hometown, um, one of the people that uh, was accused was Pete Seeger. Um, and so, yeah, just to kind of give you an idea of how far this went. Um, again, though, you know, what helped uh, give these guys credibility was that there were actual people um, who were um, spies. And so the other really, really big case is the Rosenbergs. Uh, you had Ethel and Julius Rosenberg who were charged with giving secrets to the Soviets. Uh, they were super, super crafty with it. They, um, even their children tried uh, later on to, um, you know, prove that they had been unfairly prosecuted. And yeah, they did it. Uh, and they were executed. Uh, and I'm gonna show you guys um, some pictures of the Rosenbergs in a second. 
Um, but here's um, Joseph McCarthy, and he had all these big hearings and uh, really gained himself a lot of national attention. The only problem is he went too far and he ended up um, being discredited. Uh, but yeah, certainly he was looking all over the place. And you can see, looking at this political cartoon, um, that you know this is definitely seen as um, not something that the Republican Party wanted to kind of hitch their wagon to completely. Oops, went a little bit too far. Uh, the Rosenbergs. So here's um, Ethel Rosenberg and Julius Rosenberg after they were arrested. Um, you can see their um, mugshots there. And so, yeah, near us uh, at Sing Sing, they were executed. And here are their children. Um, and like I said, you know, they, um, they tried to exonerate their parents and they were un unable to later on in life. All right, so multiple choice. In the 1950s, Senator Joseph McCarthy was most closely associated with issues related to communist infiltration and the denial of civil liberties, farm problems and taxation, military preparedness and foreign aid, or collective bargaining and the rights of unions. All right, so hopefully uh, you guys got this since we just talked about it, uh, since we're talking about the Red Scare, communist infiltration and the denial of civil liberties. And then controversies involving Alger Hiss, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg uh, reflected the post-World War II concern over testing nuclear weapon missiles, uh, joining the United Nations, placing weapons in outer space, or spying by communists in the United States. And again, I'm sure you got this based on what we just talked about, that they were spies. All right, so now here you are, you're living at home, you're hearing that communists are everywhere, uh, and it's just super, super scary if you're an American during this time. And so we talked about last time how it's not a hot war where we're directly fighting with the Soviets, but we are certainly doing that chess game uh, of one-upmanship. And so the bombs that we dropped on Japan were the A bombs. Now we're, or the atom bomb. Now we're trying to get a new and better bomb, the hydrogen bomb or the H-bomb. And so both us and the Soviets are racing to see who will get it first. And so this causes a lot, a lot of fear um, where we're very much worried that we're going to have this thing. Um, we're just gonna kind of wipe each other out. Um, people start getting really, really nervous. Um, I hope you definitely watch the duck and cover video. I always find it hilarious because I don't know that that's going to help you during a nuclear attack, but um, it just shows how desperate people were to find some sort of comfort. Uh, if you look around town, there are definitely a few places that have fallout shelter signs um, because people need to have somewhere to go in case there was um, a bomb blast. And some people were even putting in their own shelters in their own homes just to make sure that they were okay. You kind of see that today with preppers um, that, you know, they're getting all kinds of things together just in case something bad happens. And so, yeah, at this point, we're dealing with brinkmanship, the willingness to go to the edge of war. Uh, and we're going to talk more about that uh, next time when we talk about the Cuban Missile Crisis. All right, so at this point, Eisenhower is president, and he is the person that puts the end to the Korean War. Um, he continues containment, though, um, and follows a fairly similar tract um, to Truman. He does this thing called the Eisenhower Doctrine. And remember, before I told you folks, um, if you're like me and you're sort of memorizationally challenged, um, the way to remember the Truman Doctrine, Turkey, the way to remember the Marshall Plan, money, the way to remember the Eisenhower Doctrine is it would help the Middle East. And it's very, very similar to the Truman Doctrine that we're giving um, money and um, aid to the Middle East in hopes that they will be more on our side as opposed to being on the communist side. And it was really important to us that they be on our side, um, especially because they have a lot of valuable resources including oil. Uh, this is where we get the idea of the domino theory, and we talked a little bit about it last time, that if one nation falls to communism, other nations are going to follow. And so we'll talk about this more when we look at um, the Vietnam War, but all these nations that were sort of near Vietnam, there's this worry that, oh my gosh, 
If Vietnam falls, then Laos will fall and Cambodia and Thailand, Burma and India and Bangladesh. And that would just be a really bad situation. So um, Eisenhower puts into effect a lot of different things to try to prevent that from happening. All right, multiple choice break. The Eisenhower Doctrine in 1957 was an effort by the United States to, to gain control of the Suez Canal, which is in Egypt, um, take possession of the Middle East oil wells, find a homeland, homeland for Palestinian refugees, or counter the influence of the Soviet Union in the Middle East. So again, remember, um, I said E for Eisenhower and E for East. And also the idea that, again, we're talking about containment. So which would be the right answer for? And then the domino theory, popular in the 50s and 60s, assumed the expansion of South African apartheid into other African nations, totalitarianism throughout Latin America, communism into Southeast Asia, or Soviet influence into China. So I would imagine that pretty easily you would cross off one and two, since we know we're talking about communism, and you've got communism, and the Soviets were communists. Um, but we were talking about Southeast Asia when we were looking at Vietnam. All right, and uh, not only do you have an arms race going on at the same time, but you also have a space race. And so what ends up happening, and there's a really good podcast to listen to um, about this if you're interesting, interested, it's called Moonrise, I'm loving it. Um, but uh, what you have happen is the Soviets launch this really pretty small um, satellite. It's not super big. You can see how it, how big it is in relation to him. Um, you um, like it just beeped. Um, but we became so afraid that they were going to be spying on us. And so as a result, um, sort of again, like a whole series of events happen where we end up initiating a race to the moon. And we're gonna talk more about that when we talk about Kennedy. Uh, at the same, same time, we're escalating things between us and the Soviets with things like the U-2 incident. So the U-2 was a U-2 spy plane. Here it is right here, all nice and together. And so we said that we were not spying on the Soviets, but we were, and they shot down our plane. Um, they captured our pilot. Um, it's a whole big thing. If you're interested, such a good movie, watch Bridge of Spies. It's got Tom Hanks. Um, so basically, yeah, it created a lot of tensions between us and the Soviets, um, which is going to lead us into the 1960s, which is what we'll be talking about next. All right. Take care.